Hello everyone, thank you for having me. My name is Mohammed Hafiz. I work as associate professor in NTIU University in Malaysia. And uh, mainly I teach geotechnical and dam engineering for civil engineer students. And I'm going to speak to today uh, about conflict and cooperation in the uh, countries of the Nile Basin. Uh, this is my email uh, for Muhammad Hafiz, Muhammad dot Hafiz, new NT EduMai. Okay, this presentation is prepared for uh, 2023 Water Conference for United Nations and it's supposed to be uh, presented on March 23. Okay, uh, what actually we have in uh, between Nile Basin country? Uh, it seems so far it is a conflict, but can we turn this conflict to cooperation? Can we uh, have a roadmap for the uh, Nile country to uh, change or move from uh, conflict zone to cooperation zone? Mainly, what's the difference between uh, cooperation and conflict in sociology term? Is that the cooperation refers to two or more people working together to achieve common goal, while uh, conflict is uh, deliberate action by someone or some group to prevent uh, the action from another. Okay, let's before we talk on technical uh, relate to uh, Nile Basin country, we talk about some fact. The fact that the Nile River, uh, it's it's considered one of, or maybe the longest river in the in the world. It's around 6,700 kilometers. And uh, the length of navigation is something around 4,000 kilometers. Uh, it made of a few uh, rivers, not only one river. Uh, there is a river coming from Ethiopia, which is a blue Nile River. Uh, another one from Ethiopia was what you call Abbara in Sudan and Egypt, but in Ethiopia they call it Tekizi. And we have also Sobat from Ethiopia. So most of the Nile branches actually is coming from Ethiopia, while from the Victoria uh, Lake we have the White Nile, which uh, passed through many countries. Uh, estimated the water come uh, to, to Sudan and to Egypt in terms of the unified Nile is around 84 billion cubic meter per year. Uh, okay, so, all right, so this is actually the main uh, fact about uh, uh, Nile River uh, live in the Nile River country around 530 million. That is based on 2018 uh, studies. Uh, while within the uh, the valley itself or within the basin itself is almost half or 50 percent of them. It's around 270 uh, million are living within the basin. The country which shares the uh, Nile Basin uh, are uh, Burundi, Congo, Egypt, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Kenya, Rwanda, South Sudan, Sudan, Tanzania, and Uganda. Almost 11 countries, but mainly the eastern part of the Nile, which we call it uh, the Nile from Ethiopia, it's only three countries or four countries share, which is Ethiopia, Sudan, uh, and uh, Egypt mainly, and Eritrea also, uh, they have one small uh, river coming from the Tekizi. All right, here is uh, uh, the area within the Nile Basin and the area without, without, uh, outside the Nile Basin. As you can see here, uh, for example, uh, Egypt is present almost around 9.4% around 9 of the Nile base, while the Nile, Nile itself, the Nile Valley in Egypt is present as around uh, 33 of uh, Egypt in terms of area. 
Okay, here we come to the, the most critical part, which it is uh, rainfall, the rate of rainfall in the Nile country. As you can see, uh, we have a very rich country in terms of rainfall, like Kenya, we have around 1,050 mm per year. We have Ethiopia is 1,080 84 mm per year. We have a country like uh, Congo is around 1,146 1, mm per year. We have small or medium country receiving medium uh, precipitation like uh, Arteria. Uh, we have around 490 mm. Uganda receive around 1,200 mm. The poorest country in that or the most dry country is Egypt. You look to Egypt here, it's receiving only 20 mm per year. Compared to the rest of the Nile countries, uh, Nile Basin country is a 10 or the 11 countries, you have 10 countries. The, the minimum uh, rainfall is in Sudan is around 260. While Sudan rainfall is almost 13 fold of uh, Egyptian rainfall. While if you want to compare Ethiopia or Kenya or Uganda to Egypt, it, it's, it's, it's very huge, it's very huge. So a country like, like uh, Uganda, it receives almost 60 times higher than Egypt. A country like uh, Ethiopia, almost the same things, almost 660 times higher than Egypt. A country like Tanzania is almost 50 times or 52 times higher than Egypt. A uh, country like uh, South Sudan is receiving almost 50 times higher than Egypt. So the most dry country in the uh, Nile River uh, basin is Egypt. It's only 20 mm per year. Here's this map showing that uh, very low rainfall in the north of the Nile Basin country and very high rainfall in the south part of the uh, Nile Basin country. Uh, having very low rainfall is a big problem. Having very high rainfall is also a big problem. So uh, we, we expect to have kind of cooperation between uh, those country in order to uh, have a balance between uh, all country and cooperate to uh, fulfills the requirement for growth and for people living. For example, the whole countries of the 11 Nile uh, basins country receive around 7,000 billion cubic meter per year, while uh, in the Nile basin itself only is around 1,660 billion cubic, uh, cubic meter per year. Out of 1660 billion cubic meter, out of it almost 60% uh, goes to Ethiopia. Ethiopia produces almost around 963 billion cubic meter per year. It's almost around uh, 60, 60 to 20 of the total uh, rainfall uh, of the Nile Basin, uh, while the rest produce uh, much less than that. Okay, how much of all this water? whether you want to refer to the 7,000 billion cubic meter or you, which fall on the all countries uh, patients, not only Nile patient by itself, while in the Nile patient itself, it fall around 1,660 billion cubic meter. Okay, out of all this, how much goes to Egypt? Not only uh, uh, Egypt and Sudan, many in Egypt, Egypt received from the Nile 55.5 uh, billion cubic meter, 55.5 billion cubic meter only, all right? So that is a problem. We have in Egypt a very high population living on only 55.5 billion cubic meter compared to the rest of the countries in, 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 in the basin. No, they receive uh, much, much larger than that. Okay, so uh, it reached as the boundary of Egypt around uh, 84 billion cubic meter per year. Egypt take 55.5 for itself and give Sudan 18.5 billion and 
the total is 74 billion cubic meter, while there is 10 billion cubic meter goes to rainfall. That is a, actually that is a core reason of the problem between uh, Africa and country. Okay, or looking to Egypt, why Egypt received 55.5? Okay, uh, they, they think it is too much for Egypt. Let's see the fact. This is a population of the uh, Nile Basin country. Uh, you, you have two main countries here, like Egypt. Uh, this population is between uh, 2012 and 2020. In 2012, Egypt has around uh, 88 million uh, population, uh, while in 2020 is around 100 million population. Now into 2023 is reaching around 105 million population. While Ethiopia uh, in uh, 2012, it has around 92 million. Uh, by 2020 become 112, expecting by 2023 to around 115 million. All uh, countries in the Nile Basin are increasing. The, 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 the growth, the population growth is really increasing. For example, Congo within nine, uh, eight years from 2012 to 2020 increased almost uh, 20 million from 69 uh, in 2012 to 89 2020. So generally one of the main problem of the uh, Nile Basin country is a high population growth. Okay, this is what we predict in uh, 2030 and 2050. For example, you look to Egypt, it is in 2030, the population will reach to 120 million, and in 2050 will increase to 153 million. You look to Ethiopia in 12, it is 140 million, uh, sorry, in 2030 is 140 million. In 2050, it will become, in 2050, it will become around 190. It will increase almost 50 uh, million within 20 years. Egypt will increase almost around 30 million within 20 years, between 2030 to 2050. The other country follows the same pattern. So, Population growth in the Nile Basin is one of the problem and actually is induce a lot of pressure on the uh, governments. Okay, here is a table to show the uh, population, uh, is, is the, 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 the growth of GDP. Of course, when the population increase, generally the uh, GDP has to be also increased, but actually the rate of GDP growth is much less than the population growth. That is second reason for uh, Nile Basin country. You look to Egypt uh, in uh, 2012, the the growth was around the rate of growth is around 2.2, .2. in 2019 is around 5.6. In Ethiopia, Ethiopia is really uh, achieving very good economic growth. In uh, 2020, 2012 was around 8.6%, in uh, 2019 is around 8.3%. It's almost constant. Many countries like Rwanda also is almost constant, it's, it's high rate. Uh, while there is country like Sudan, the growth in, it is not gross, it is negative. It, they are getting poorer for many reasons, which we will discuss later. Okay, if you look to the water used in uh, uh, Nile Basin country, you will find out most of the countries, they use the water for agriculture and drinking water. Agriculture and drink, while only, maybe only Egypt, which use uh, the water for, uh, other than that, is for industry. So the industry element for the Nile countries is actually in some country is almost zero or a little bit is not really uh, corresponding to the number of the population uh, in the country. One of the reason here, and this is actually is a core reason for the uh, being uh, uh, quite poor countries, that most of the Nile Basin country uh, is considered the big farm to some European country where uh, 
they provide a lot of uh, food, vegetable, whatever, uh, from, from, from their country for export. Uh, so it is okay to export. We have no objection with that. But we can, we, a night basin country should not export raw material. They should at least manufacture by 25%. So instead of exporting uh, timber as a log, no, they have to export the timber in terms of uh, furniture, in terms of uh, material which can be used for other industry. But to export uh, raw material uh, just straight away like this without adding value by increasing the percentage of uh, industry or by manufacturing it at least by 25%, that will help the GDP for that countries and also will elevate the poverty in that country. So one of the reason for poverty in, in, in Nile countries is they, they export raw material without adding value by manufacturing. Here is uh, some statistic on uh, how much water goes to agriculture, how much go to industry, how much go to service. As you can see, for this is between 2000, 2012 and 2017. As you can see for the industry, uh, it, it is not really much. It is around 19% and uh, in, two, in year tw uh, 2000. In 2012, it's almost increased by 2%. In uh, 2017, increased by uh, also 2%. But uh, agriculture remained almost constant. Okay, what, what the key to uh, improve the GDP for uh, Nile Basin country is to increase this sector, increase the industry, increase the manufacture. So instead of exporting the raw material as a raw, no, they must add value by uh, manufacturing it by at least 25 percent. Uh, hydrology and future climate change to the Nile Basin country, as we can see in the screen here, uh, this study is between 19 86 to 2005, uh, that one in, in the, uh, the, the, the change in average precipitation, and also to 2018, this is future one to 2000, uh, 2081 to 2100. As you can see here, the change here, uh, the yellow color is showing, indicating uh, the dry part of the world in general. Uh, you look to the Nile Pacing country, you find the north part is getting drier, even in future. While the south part of the Nile Pacing country, like Congo, like Ethiopia, no, they are going to receive more water. So more water will cause too much flood to that country and destroy economy. While dry in the north also will cause too much uh, suffering to the people there. So, both they have problem, and the problem of South Nile uh, Basin country is a solution for the North, for the North country. So we can actually cooperate to uh, to complement each other. Here is a, a study on the impact of uh, climate change on hydrology of. Uh, only Blue Basin Nile, not the whole Nile. Uh, as you can see, over years, until 2100, 100, uh, the uh, rainfall is getting less and less, getting less and less. And this is a kind of uh, increasing of the uh, uh, world or planet uh, temperature that caused the rainfall to become less and less over years. All right, we are li still living here. We are still living until 2020 to 2040. We, we are somewhere here. We are okay until now. But after 2040, no, the rainfall will get less and less, while the evaporation will increase at the same time. This because due to the increasing of the Earth's uh, temperature. So we will have a lot of problem here. We won't have enough uh, rain for the countries. Okay, as we see, as we said earlier, the Nile 
uh, is made of mainly a few branches. Uh, one uh, or main branches come from Achibia, which it is Blue Nile, Blue Nile and uh, Tekizi, which the Arab call it Adbara. So this is Adbara or Tekizi, and this is Blue Nile. As you can see, the monthly uh, average flow it fluctuates from month to month. Some months is very dry. You look to Tekizi or Adbara, is very very little amount. While only on the summer uh, months the flood increase, increase. In you can see in uh, July, August, September, Adbara or Tekizi River increase. Uh, the same pattern apply to Blue Nile, but maybe the flood uh, season is longer than uh, Adbara or Tekizi. Uh, the, 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 the flow start increase from July, increase more to August, September, October. So the four months of the summer, or we call it the flood, uh, that, f that four months actually provide almost around 35 billion cubic meter out of around 49 cubic meter, which is the annual uh, flow of the Blue Nile. The Blue Nile over the year, the total flow is around 49 billion cubic meter. 35 billion cubic meter come during the summertime. It comes from these two branches mainly, Tekizi or Agbara and the Blue Nile. Uh, that's why uh, the, uh, the, the, the flow for the Blue Nile, uh, we can look at it uh, from year uh, 1921 until 2015 is almost 100 years. You can see uh, we in, in some years we have high flow, high uh, flow, it reached almost around 70 billion, while the average is 49 or actually 48.5. But some years we get 70 billion in some years, while in other years we, we can reach almost 20 billion. 20 billion, which meaning around 40% uh, of the average. We have a drought in the year uh, 1913. The, the, the flow was almost 20 billion. So when the Nile, uh, Blue Nile provide only 20 billion, at that time the Egyptian will have no water at all, even for drinking. So for the Egyptians, they must build them to avoid this problem. So once we, in, in 1913, after the Egyptian learned the lesson, then they have to build the Aswan High Dam in order to maintain some storage for future. So uh, the, 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 the drop of uh, Blue Nile uh, flow happened many times. It's almost happened every 20 years. So we have here the period between 1940 to 1949, it's almost 10 years. The flow reached around 38 uh, million, while in the drought during 1978 to 1987, uh, it reached almost around 35 to uh, 36 million cubic meter, which is not sufficient at all. And all this before Ethiopia and Sudan start building some dams. So the annual flow uh, of the Blue Nile uh, at the border between Ethiopia and Sudan is almost around 48.5. And here is one of the problem which we're going to talk about it later. Okay, the second uh, water source for the Nile is a White Nile. White Nile has uh, mainly two, 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 two flow, one come from Victoria Lake and the one come from uh, uh, Malkal, uh, Malkal near to the South Sudan. So this, this two source provide the uh, White Nile uh, water which combine or which meet the Blue Nile near to Khartoum in Sudan and form the unified Nile. All right, as you can see also here for Victoria Lake, uh, the average rainfall or the average storage is, is fluctuate too much, 
fluctuate too much. So, for, for, for example, since uh, uh, year 1960, the storage was around 600 billion cubic meter. After that increase, almost to uh, 2,000 billion cubic meter, meaning 2 trillion cubic meter, and drop over years, drop then increase. Recently, since last 10 years, uh, the flow was improving. It's reached even above the uh, 2 trillion cubic meter. But we cannot depend on the natural flow of the Victoria Lake because, as you can see, in 2019, for example, or 2015, it's above 2, 2 trillion cubic meter, the storage, while in some times it reached to 1 trillion cubic meter here. In, uh, in, in, in year 1977, for example, it is one trillion cubic meter, while in 2015 or 16 was above two trillion cubic meter. So the, 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 the flow for Victoria uh, is really uh, changing too much w over time. Okay, uh, here is a key issue which actually consider the main cause for the problem between Egypt and Sudan in one side and the rest of the uh, Nile Basin country. As you can see here, this is uh, uh, the hydrology station in a place called Donkola, which south of Aswan. And this is the, 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 the last hydraulic and hydrology station before the water goes to uh, as one dam. As you can see here, uh, the, the total total flow passed through Donkola yearly is around 84 billion cubic meter. And here is uh, here is uh, the flow over months. And you can see in July, August, September, October, mainly this is the flood months which receive the most of the water. That before the uh, uh, building any barrier like uh, the Achibian dams. Okay, uh, as you can see, this, this is what as Egypt and Sudan to get. It's around 84 billion cubic meter. This 84 billion cubic meter come through what you call it runoff. So as early I showed to you that uh, we have around 1,700 billion cubic meter of water run within the Nile Basin uh, Valley. But uh, how much of that goes to the Nile? As mentioned at the end, it re end up by 84. So from 1,660 billion cubic meter fall in the Nile Basin country, only 84 billion goes to the runoff, which actually used by Egypt and uh, Sudan. So the reason is here the problem here is the runoff coefficient. The runoff coefficient is represents the fraction of the rainfall that reach to the river system and is available for the uh, downstream user. So as you can see here, the runoff coefficient is very little. Is very little. For example, you look to uh, White Nile in the year between 1960 to uh, 1988. Uh, you look to the uh, White Nile. Not White Nile. Uh, it was the the run of coefficient uh, between 60s for the 30 years between 60s to 90s. It was 0 0.07. While between 90s to uh, 2015, it was 0.05. It dropped in a set of increasing. So the first 30 years between 1960 to 1990, the runoff is 0.07. While between 90, 1990 to 2015, it is 0.05, which shouldn't be that. It should increase because we have we we have the technology now to increase the runoff from 0.07 to make it uh, 0 0.1 or 0 0.11 to increase, not to drop. And this drop, as you see, it happened in many countries, especially countries located in the White Nile. That is indicating that we are not really 
fully utilizing the uh, possibility to increase the run off in uh, White Nile and we have a lot of rooms to improve that. So to solve the problem, uh, to, uh, to, to get enough runoff to the s dry country like Egypt and Sudan, mainly Egypt, is, it is located here in, in the South Country. We should help the South Country to increase the runoff coefficient. Increasing the runoff coefficient uh, that will help to in improve the uh, run, off, run off water which goes to the river. Then we can use it for uh, running or building dams or we produce hydraulic energy and at the end the water can go to the uh, dry country like Egypt and Sudan. Here is a uh, the power capacity in the Nile Basin country. I will focus mainly on Egypt, Ethiopia, and South Sudan because these three countries is a problem and the solution at the same time. You look to the Egypt, we have around uh, 45,000 megawatt per year. Megawatt per, year, uh, uh, per hour. Produce 45,000 megawatt per hour. But out of that, how many percent depend on the hydropower. It's only 6%. So 6% out of 45,000 are, are, uh, are, are hydropower, which come from mainly Aswan Dam, which produce around 2,800 megawatt. While you look to Ethiopia, Ethiopia, the total uh, power they have is around 4,300 megawatt only while the population is almost same like Egypt. While out of this 4,300 megawatt, 88% depend on the hydro, where they will reduce around 3,800 uh, megawatt. That before the Renaissance Dam. So after Renaissance Dam, many will increase. So as you can see, Egypt is not really depend or making full use or making much use of the hydropower, even we have the high dam. But we, we are depending mainly on the thermal power, where we produce around 41,300 megawatt hour in thermal. We pay for it. And the hydropower is only present almost 6%. In Ethiopia, the hydropower presents 88.5%. In Sudan, South Sudan, uh, actually, South Sudan is very low in terms of power uh, authorization or use uh, there is no enough data but we know that they are the poorest country in within the Nile Basin country and they should improve the improvement for South Sudan and uh, provide them enough power and electricity this actually presents a solution to Egypt so here is a problem to South Sudan and that problem actually if we solve it for the South Sudan, it will help Egypt as well. While the other country like Tanzania, they produce around uh, 1,400 megawatt per hour. They depend, depend on hydropower by around 40%. And here we have to mention that Egypt government is uh, building a new dam to, in Tanzania, uh, which will produce around uh, 2,100 uh, uh, megawatt, almost uh, almost thirty percent higher than what they have today. So th you, you you add here two thousand one hundred. So the, at the end of the building of that dam, uh, Tanzania will have something around three thousand five hundred megawatt, and the amount of or the percentage of hydropower will increase to almost eighty percent or eighty five percent. So Egypt, they are contributing and they are helping to build them in Tanzania. We build them in Uganda as well. So we, as, as Egyptian, we, we went out through uh, Nile Basin country. We extend our hand. We help them to uh, build them as long as that can improve the runoff. So when we build them, to uh, countries, actually, we are not taking their money, uh, their, their water. We are only improving this runoff coefficient. When we improve the runoff coefficient, uh, the country can have enough 
run off water in the river they can use for producing electricity for themselves and the out uh, the, 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 the the discharge of the dam will go to Egypt so it will be multi-purpose all benefit the, the, the two country we produce electricity of the runoff water for the Uganda for Tanzania for uh, South Sudan and the water at the end goes to Egypt so it is win-win situation the challenge what challenge do we have actually uh, when we look to the uh, Nile Basin country each country has its own challenge inside itself and with its neighbor as well but I cannot talk about all challenge I will focus mainly on the main challenge which really uh, creating a lot of conflict between uh, Nile Pacing country. The greatest one is the Ethiopian Dam, which it is built now in Ethiopia, in the Blue Nile, uh, at the border between Egypt, uh, between Sudan and Ethiopia. It's called Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam. In brief, we call it GERD, G-E-R-D. It is made of around 1,780 meter uh, RCC concrete dam. Uh, the height is around, the concrete height is around 155 meter, while the water, water height is around 140 meter. Okay, uh, it, it, they have around uh, 13 turbine, uh, supposedly to produce around uh, 5,150 megawatt, all right? Uh, and they have here to ensure that they can uh, uh, store more water than the topography allows them. So they build what we call it saddle dam. This one of the largest or the longest uh, dam we have in the world is 5,200 meter uh, rock field dam. Uh, that, that rock field dam is to close the gap between these two mountains and that will help Ethiopia to store more water in the reservoir, all right? While Initially, the, 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 the plan for this dam, which at that time, 30 years ago, they call it X dam or border dam, uh, the height of the dam was something around 90 or 95 meter, not, 100, not 155 meter, and the storage was around 11 billion cubic meter. Now, uh, mainly when recently after the Egyptian revolution between day and night they has increased the uh, reservoir capacity from 11 billion cubic meter to 74 uh, billion cubic meter even the latest survey shows that this reservoir can carry up to 85 billion cubic meter but what written in the uh, in the website and the information uh, between scholar it is 74 but in reality can go to 80, 85 billion cubic meter and this is saddle dam this is one of the biggest or greatest challenge between nile pacing country so here is uh, some details about it all right uh, okay here here is a more we have to stop here the efficiency factor for the dam is around 80 uh, 28.6 percent that is very low efficiency factor so you can build you can put whatever number you wish of the uh, number of turbine in your dam but do you have enough water to run all this turbine this is what we call capacity factor or if uh, dam uh, uh, coefficient factor so Ethiopia has installed uh, initially installed 16 turbine they cancelled three now they have 13 turbine uh, 11 of them uh, is in uh, high level uh, produce supposedly is a Francis turbine produce around 375 uh, 350 uh, megawatt uh, while the other uh, turbine in the low uh, low low level uh, it produce around 350 megawatt okay so we have 13 turbine 13 turbine can the water reservoir or the flow the natural flow of the blue nile can uh, sustain all this big number of turbine for sure no that's why the capacity factor is too low so if 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 uh, Ethiopia improves the capacity factor that will help to uh, solve the problem 
uh, with its neighbor. So as you can see here, uh, the, the, the Nile, which goes uh, to Sudan and Egypt, which start uh, combined between uh, Blue Nile and White Nile in Khartoum. Uh, so as you can see, the, uh, the elevation of the Blue Nile is very high because in, in Tana, Tana Lake, the starting point of the Blue Nile, uh, is above 2,000 meters above the sea level, uh, while uh, the White Nile is much less, it's around 1,200, 1,300 above the sea level. All right, so it, Ethiopia potentially has a very great potential for hydropower. And I, I as an expert in dam engineering, uh, actually I have no objection for Ethiopia to build as big as as much as many number of dam in the Blue Nile because they have the topography to do that. But the problem, you cannot build big or large dam. You should build small dam, sessional dam, which use the water only for producing electricity. So when the flood come next year, the, your dam is almost empty. Then you can refill. But having a huge storage, like what we have in the Renaissance Dam, that is a big problem. Big problem to Ethiopia and also to Egypt. So uh, here, here is a Blue Nile. As I said, Ethiopia, instead of building huge dam, they can build many small dams, and that one co will produce even more electricity to the local people and without causing any trouble. So that is a, a natural flow at, uh, at the border between Ethiopia and uh, Sudan. As you can see, during July, August, September, October, they receive almost around 35 billion cubic meter out of uh, 48.5 billion cubic meters, the average uh, flow uh, at the border. So this only 48.5 billion cubic meter, which actually the 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 the, the 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 cause of the problem between the uh, basin country, especially the eastern part of the Nile. Okay, uh, okay. To, to the, the problem, uh, Ethiopia and Egypt and Sudan try their best to solve the problem among themselves, but they fell. Then, for the last ten years, uh, they try to find a compromise, uh, but as I said, they totally fell. Uh, to reach to uh, solution. That's why uh, Mr. Trump, the American president, has interfered personally to solve the problem. Even Trump failed to solve the problem. Uh, okay, what actually is the problem? In very simple term, I'm not going to use complicated uh, term. Okay, you see here, here is a blue Nile. Here is the upstream, here is the downstream. Uh, now, the Blue Nile, or uh, Ethiopia is building uh, GERD, GERD, all right? And uh, for, 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 ta for, 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 for a time being, or at present, it's not full yet. And after GERD, we have uh, Sudanese dams. We have three Sudanese dam resorts, uh, Rosaris, uh, Sinar, and Marwi. And at the end, we have uh, high as one dam. So today, as I'm talking in March 2023, the situation we have little amount of water in GERD, while uh, the Sudanese all Sudanese dams all are full, and the Aswan dam also full. Okay, let's see during after filling the uh, GERD dam what will happen. So after filling the GERD dam, the dam will be uh, fully. Uh, filled by almost 2025 or by end of 2024. All right, then the Sudanese also will be the Sudanese dams also will be full of water, while the High Aswan Dam will be almost as a dead storage, almost as a dead storage. That is a problem. That is a problem. That. Filling up a huge reservoir in GERD, that will cause uh, high, uh, high Aswan Dam to reach to its uh, dead storage. Okay, that is during filling and operation. But in other cases, when we have drought, as I mentioned earlier, as I mentioned here, 
as I mentioned here, uh, as I mentioned here, Blue Nile has drought last almost for 10 years. Between time to time, every 20 years, we get a drought for 10 years. So during drought, for long drought, or we'd call it prolonged drought, what will happen? It can, for 10 years, no enough water for GERD, no enough water for Sudanese dam, no enough water for uh, high Aswan dam. This would be the end of uh, Egypt life in, in terms of population, in terms of state, in terms of everything. Because it can last for 10 years. 10 years, no enough water for GERD, for uh, Renaissance dam. And of course, not enough water for uh, Sudanese dam. For sure, won't have enough water for uh, High Aswan Dam and Egyptian. All right? At that time, we don't have water even for drinking. All right? This is a problem which we must find solution for it. We must find solution for it. All right? Uh, okay. Uh, just, just for example, can can the, uh, did, did this event happen before? Yes, it happened before. You look here to the drought. Uh, years between 1978 to 1988, 10 years the Blue Nile was uh, supplying less water supply to uh, High Dam, to Nasser Lake, until the, the, the level, the water storage in Aswan Dam reached to 150.6 above sea level. 150.6 above sea level, it is almost 0.6 meter above the dead storage. Because the dead storage for the turbine fixed recently in, in, in uh, High Aswan Dam is 150. So it was only 0.6 meter above the dead storage. And that without having two big uh, dams on the Blue Nile, like uh, Renaissance Dam, and Renaissance Dam in Ethiopia and Marwi in Sudan. So now, after 1988, we got two dams, two extra dams. So if this drought session happened again, with existing of Marwi in Sudan, uh, with existing of Renaissance Dam, what will happen? That will be the end of Egypt as people, as civilization, as a state. So here, this is a very serious problem which can spark war between countries. So if we don't have a global uh, solution to solve this problem, then we have to expect a big conflict between that country. We will not allow Egypt and e Egypt to die or Egyptian to die. Okay? So the, the International and the United Nations International Com uh, Committee and United Nations should interfere at the beginning, before the things get worse. All right? OK, this is some scenarios on uh, what will happen after or during filling of the Renaissance Dam, uh, whether five years, six years. It depends mainly on how much water we have in the high dam. But we have three scenarios here, depend on how much water we have in the high dam. But all the three scenarios agree that after four years of the uh, feeling of the Renaissance Dam, the, 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 the level in the Nasser Lake or Aswan Dam will reach to the dead storage. So now Ethiopia in, 2000, in August 2023, they are going to fill up uh, Renaissance Dam for the fourth, the fourth time. And next year, 2024, they will uh, finalize the feeling of the Renaissance Dam. And by that time, by September or October 2024, the, it's expecting the uh, level at high, uh, high Aswan Dam to reach almost to the dead storage. Okay, uh, does this event happen before? Does this happen before? Yes, it happened. Okay, you look here to Turkana Lake or Lake Turkana in Kenya. Which one of the, uh, the most beautiful natural lake in Kenya? Which you get its water from uh, uh, one of the Omo, Omo River in Ethiopia. All right, so after Ethiopia built a series of dams on Omo rivers, uh, the biggest one is GB3. What happened to the dam? The water dropped 40 meters. So at the beginning, it dropped 7 meters. 
then drop 22, then drop 40 meters, until, until this, 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 what you see here, this is a portal, uh, the bottom of Turkana Lake, which was before GB3, was one of the uh, largest uh, natural uh, lake. So is it uh, going to be repeated in Egypt? Yes, it's high possibility that the Nasser Lake, the largest man-made lake in the Africa, it might face the same fate of Turkana Lake. lake, uh, lake. So we, as Egyptian, as Egypt state, we cannot, cannot afford that Egypt Lake uh, to become a uh, reputation of Turkana Lake. Turkana is in Kenya. Kenya, as I showed you early, even there is no Turkana, if there is no Omo River at all uh, to, 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 to Kenya, it shouldn't be a big problem because they have other source of water where the rainfall rate is around 1,200 uh, mm per year. But Egypt cannot uh, offer what or accept what Kenya has accept because Egypt the rainfall is only 20 mm per year. Okay, uh, is is a problem between Egypt and Ethiopia uh, will end up by completing of Renaissance Dam? No, it won't end up by completing of the Renaissance Dam because the Renaissance Dam uh, it it has been designed to be at the end of the. Uh, downstream of other three dams. So Ethiopia is planning to build four dams. The first is a uh, Renaissance dam or GERD. Then we have three more dams, uh, Dam Mandia, uh, Mabila, and Kardobi. These are three uh, dams which plan to be built on the upstream of uh, Renaissance dam. The total storage of the four dams, including uh, Renaissance, it will be 2,002 billion cubic meter. While, as I mentioned earlier, the total flow of the Blue Nile at the S S Sudan, Ethiopia, it was only 48 billion cubic meter. Means the four dams are capable to store almost five, uh, four floods, four yearly flood, without allowing one water to go to the downstream. So the capacity of these four dams is 202 billion cubic meter, while the natural flow runoff at the Sudan Achibia is only uh, is, is less than 50 billion cubic meter. So this is a coming to be one of the biggest problems between uh, the eastern uh, part of the uh, Nile. Okay, that in Achibia. So what about Egypt? Egypt is uh, this is the Egypt water demand between uh, year 1990 to 2050, meaning six years. As you can see, uh, the amount of water uh, per citizen, uh, almost, almost in the year 2000, we almost reached to the poverty line. Poverty line meaning 1000. So it was around 1058 cubic meter per year, while 25 years later, in 2050, it, it, it is 620. Actually, this is wrong information. It is now 2023. It is around 520 uh, cubic meter. That without including the, uh, the shortage due to the Renaissance Dam. If, if no Renaissance Dam, uh, the, it is expected by 2050, it will be around 460 cubic meter per citizen per citizen, which means almost less than 50% of the poverty line. We know the poverty line, the water poverty line is 1,000 uh, cubic meter per citizen. So this is the situation in Egypt now and in future, that without including the uh, Renaissance Dam. So what if we add the Renaissance Dam? It, it will be uh, a disaster. So we look here, does Egypt uh, maximize the use of the water yes they we, we as the egyptian we try to maximize the use of the water to, to 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 the best we can for example we treat the domestic wastewater uh, in 2001 it was only 0 0.7 billion cubic meter in 2017 
we treat 2.5 billion cubic meter. Yearly, uh, recently in 2022, after opening a few treatment plant, we reach almost to 5 billion cubic meter. That is a waste, uh, domestic waste water, which has been treated and reused for other, uh, for mainly for irrigation. The same applies to the industrial waste water. We, 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 we treat almost 6.7 yearly cubic uh, billion cubic meter yearly. So, uh, and also the agricultural drainage water is almost uh, 8.5 in 2017. Now it's reaching to 10 billion. So the total uh, reuse water in Egypt is almost above 22 billion cubic meter. All right. So putting any blame on Egypt that we are not really maximize the use, actually it is not true because we try to uh, maximize the use of each drop of water in Egypt. Okay, uh, is that enough for Egypt? No, it's not enough. So in 2015, the amount of the exported water, or to call the virtual water, which, which we have export, cost Egypt to export, uh, to import 49 billion cubic meter of virtual water. Virtual water in terms of uh, grains, in terms of meat, in terms of uh, uh, other product. So in 2015, we import almost 50 billion cubic meter of virtual water. Uh, it comes in, in other form like grains, like uh, meat, like uh, milk product, all right? Oil, uh, okay. In 2023, the amount increased almost reaching to 55 billion cubic meter. And this be translated into dollar, cent and dollar. So it's really cost Egypt too much all right, so that is the first challenge. The second challenge is in South Sudan, is what you call Sudut Swamp. We have a, a very large piece uh, or sector of South Sudan, uh, which it is actually mainly swamp, which is called Sudut, Sudut Swamp. Uh, this is how it looks like. This is how the South Sudanese people live in, all right? It is a big problem for them. It is a big problem for them. We should extend our hand to help them to have a better life. We are in 21st century. We should not allow a community to live such life. The problem here, actually solving the problem here, will benefit the South Sudanese and also benefit Egypt. As you can see, the waterway of the White Nile in the Sudud swamp area, it wasting a lot of water. There is a lot of water being wasted during uh, evaporation and uh, groundwater as well. Okay, facing the challenge. We cannot face or we cannot solve any of that challenge unless we extend uh, helping hand to each other. Okay, we, we should trust each other. We should uh, extend our hand to help. All right, and you are not helping him or he helping you, but we are helping each other. Okay, in terms of the first challenge, which it is Ethiopian Dam, uh, a Ethiopian uh, government keeps saying that they can reduce around uh, 550 megawatt. Yes, I agree with them. Yes, you can reduce 5,150 megawatt hour. But for how long? Even if the reservoir is full. You can reduce this amount of power maybe for one week or two weeks. If you, It will never remain for the whole year. Because if you do it for the whole years, you, you need another reservoir on the top of what you have. All right? So because you have, you, you, you have 13 turbines, to, to, to run 13 turbines to produce that amount, that will, won't, won't, won't be an economical solution. The economical solution to make sure or to ensure that you are running all the ter or m most of the turbine, you need to... Uh, to, to run your turbine to uh, to produce amount or to discharge amount of water which it is 1450 cubic meter per second if you if you discharge 1450 cubic meter per second that will uh, ensure you running at least around uh, five to six turbine continuously 24 hours, 365 days, all right? 
while if you think you can reduce 5,150, 5, yes, you can reduce for a very short while during the flood for two weeks, three weeks, then your reservoir will drop too much. All right, so here is the solution. Okay, if you want to keep the reservoir with that amount of water, it's okay. We, we, now we cannot solve it because it's already, it's already built. Okay, but you must guarantee that you can be reduced at least, or can you discharge from your turbine at least 1,450 uh, cubic meter per second out of your turbine. And that will allow you to run at least around uh, uh, five turbine, five to six turbine. Uh, and, and this five to six turbine will allow you to produce something around uh, 2,000 100 megawatt. So you are not producing uh, uh, 5,150 megawatt. You cannot produce it for full year, but for the full year, you can produce only 2,100 megawatt. Only that it will be sufficient for you to, to run over the year and also to, uh, to discharge enough water. That, that will be enough water for Sudan and Egypt without causing any problem. Okay, how to uh, encourage Ethiopia to reduce that amount, 1,450 uh, cubic meter per second, without causing any economical uh, uh, harm to them, because they have also to benefit. So I propose one solution here. First, to reduce the electricity, the electricity should be used for other product. So I propose here uh, is building uh, aluminium simulator hub near the uh, Renaissance Dam because that kind of industry consume a lot of electricity. And the aluminium as a, as a, as a, as a, as a material now in the, in the global market, the price is increasing yearly. So uh, to ensure that Ethiopia can produce or can reduce this amount of water, which will be around 2,100 megawatt per hour. And if we encourage Ethiopia to invest or, or rich country in the region to invest in building a big hub of aluminum industry nearby, that will ensure uh, enough electricity, enough water supply, discharge from the turbine, and both will improve the GDP for Ethiopia by adding value by, by, by exporting aluminium, mainly because they have the sedimentation from the rivers, which is uh, kaolin uh, and uh, clay mineral, which it is needed for aluminium. You have a lot of aluminium in the sedimentation. So mainly the aluminium industry is built nearby uh, them because they, they consume a lot of electricity and they have to search for cheap electricity, cheap megawatt. That in terms of our, uh, uh, GERD or Renaissance stamp. The second problem is the South Sudan. South Sudan, as we have seen, is a swampy area. And, 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 and the, the, the plain is flooded all the time. So Egypt has proposed since almost 50 years ago to help South Sudan by, uh, by, by, by building or constructing what you call a uh, jungle, jungle canal which it is around 300 meter, 300 ki uh, kilometer, 340 kilometer. And this canal can be used to drain partially or partially drain some of the water of the swampy area and have increased the uh, runoff coefficient, then it will be filled with water and that water will go to Egypt. And this swampy area, instead of being swampy, no, it will be a better land for uh, plantation. So the South Sudanese people can uh, convert this swamp area into an economical land by uh, using for agriculture. What happened to this great uh, project? It after Egypt has investing millions of dollars in uh, digging the canal, then the, uh, the the civil war started in in South Sudan, and they burned all the Egyptian machinery and uh, it was too much trouble and too much losses. So we have to collaborate, we have to cooperate together to help each other, S South Sudanese people and Egyptian, by constructing this canal, because it will be win-win. It's not only Egyptian going to win, but also South Sudanese going to win. 
that is one solution solution but is it sufficient this this canal will provide something around 5 billion cubic meter part of it will go to sudan and part go to, to egypt so egypt will benefit it by two or three billion cubic meter can this two three billion cubic meter compensate the losses uh, of the water due to the renaissance dam for sure no it will be even less than 10 percent of the uh, what we expect so to, we need to find a permanent solution uh, for this crisis, uh, not only for Egypt, but for the north area of Africa. So we have to look to the Congo River. Congo River is one of the largest river after Amazon River. Uh, the amount of water in the uh, Congo River is huge. Uh, it's enough to discharge or drain one trillion cubic meter of water really in the Atlantic Ocean. So one trillion, one thousand billion cubic meter of water is drained from uh, Congo River to the Atlantic Ocean. While the north part of Africa, as you can see, is dry. So I uh, call and invite the international community, mainly United Nations, World Bank, to invest invest in producing or having some connection between Congo River and this dry area, Libya, Egypt, Sudan, Tashad. We, instead of wasting or draining all the one billion, one trillion cubic meter in the Atlantic Ocean here, why not we, we just take 10% of it, 100 billion cubic meter only. From this point, we can, we can we connect it to Tashad Lake, the, the lake of Tashad, which getting dry, yearly and become desert nowadays so, and from from that lake we 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 we, sp we, we split the water in 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 the form of y shape uh, where it goes to egypt go to libya go to sudan so we can have a collective investment from this three country with support of world bank to provide a kind of uh, connection or link between these two regions this is what we have in Congo. Yearly, we have high flood, large flood, which people are dying. Country been, uh, cities been destroyed. Country been uh, drowned underwater. So having enough water in Congo is not actually a privilege for the Congo uh, people because they, they, they are dying due to uh, huge flood. So we can find win-win solution here by reducing the amount of water in Congo River and provide it to the poor people in the North Africa, which is really having very little water and after building the Renaissance Dam will have even uh, less water. So my proposal here, which I have proposed to Egyptian government since, uh, since 2015, is to build a tunnel uh, somewhere from the Kong River, goes up to Teshed and drain its water into uh, Teshad Lake and from Teshad Lake we can have uh, some connection like Y shape uh, one goes to Egypt and Sudan and one goes to uh, uh, what you call uh, uh, Libya so I I is it is it is it impossible not it is possible this photo I'm showing to you it is a tunnel between two states in Malaysia here where I live they importing water from a north state to a south state and the length of the tunnel is around 150 kilometer if we can have 150 kilometer in malaysia we can have 1000 kilometer between the three countries so i propose uh, to egypt sudan libya as well tashad four country to connect to the uh, congo river through underground tunnel not through a surface connection as been proposed by some expert is to connect the Congo basin to the white Nile basin and that there is there is a difference in elevation something's around 250 meter all right so the Congo is lower than the white uh, basin by around 250 meter which create too much trouble while here if we think about underground tunnel uh, from one of this elevation, which is around say between 380 above sea level to 400 uh, to 350 above sea level, connect from this zone. We connect uh, underground 
tunnel, water tunnel, up to the shed. The shed lake is around 180 meter above sea water. So you have 180 to 170 meter uh, different in head between this position and the shed. So the water will run under gravity. You no need uh, pump station, you no need uh, electricity. The water will run under gravity from this high altitude to the Tashad Lake, which it is low altitude by, by at least 100 to 150 meter. Then from Tashad Lake, we uh, divert the water to uh, South Egypt, North Sudan, and Libya. So four countries can benefit out of this project, Tashad, Egypt, Sudan, and Libya. So if World Bank can invest in such project, I think this will be uh, will change the, 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 the economy and the life of uh, these four countries. Okay, this is a tunnel I propose from this area, goes to the shed, and from the shed we can have one branch go to Sudan, other go to Egypt, other go to Libya. All right, so what we hope to transfer is at least 10% uh, of the water which drain in Atlantic Ocean, uh, they, they drain around 1,000 billion cubic meter. We are looking only for 100 billion cubic meter, which will uh, revive these four countries and the population there. All right. So this is a mega project which needs a lot of investment, and that can be done by World Bank. Okay. The other uh, solution I propose it is having uh, a network transportation road between Egypt, mainly Alexandria, and Cape Town in. Sudan, and this being proposed by Egyptian government, because uh, we need to cooperate not only in terms of water supply, no, it's also we need to cooperate to increase the interrelation between the people first, then the government, by uh, producing something like free market. So why not Tanzanian uh, fruit to be sold in Egypt? Or why not Tanzanian fruit can, can export to Europe through Alexandria? So uh, building a, net, a road network between uh, Nile countries or Nile Basin country extend to even non-Nile uh, countries like Cape Town and South Sudan. That will really improve the life of the people who the road pass through it and also will economically will increase or will, uh, will, will really have a great impact and through this road, we can have free market. Why not we don't have free market? We should have a free market for the uh, Nile Basin country, somewhere in Sudan here, for example. All right? So we can uh, have more access to African product, to, uh, to Europe, to America, with cheap transportation. All right? Uh, Congo, for example. Congo, for example, we, we, we produce a lot of fishery, a lot of uh, fruits, a lot of vegetable. Can directly export to Europe through this road. So this is some of the of my proposal to solve the problem. So in conclusion, uh, I, I will read my I, I will read it straight away. Uh, the Nile Basin country should seek to build a confidence and capacity across the basin through a shared benefit of the Nile River. And to implement project in partnership with member states that will contribute to strengthen the cooperation mechanism and uh, to long-term uh, sustainability development in terms of economic growth, regional integra integration. Uh, they should contribute to the creation of enabling environment for investment and action on the ground and, will pro and, and, and that will promote and share benefit through the uh, uh, set of effective basin uh, wide activities. Uh, they should apply projects which contribute to water efficiency, integrated water resources management, uh, conf confidence building between peoples of the uh, Nile Basin country, and increase the awareness to achieve their objective and expected impact. Uh, third, uh, lastly, is to improve the hydropower production and irrigation efficiency, leading to an overall increase in land productivity, uh, which will yield higher agriculture uh, output and enhance the food uh, security in the countries. Uh, uh, number seven, integrated and joint basin management offer to the greatest opportunity to unlock economic growth, promote regional integration, and realizing the uh, realize, uh, realize the peace 
and stability in the peace and countries. Uh, number eight, to identify step to increase food security through increasing investment, income, uh, uh, integration, and economic growth. This is my conclusion. And uh, uh, the key word here is integration. Integration, not confrontation, is the ultimate solution for Nile Basin country. This is my uh, final recommendation, and thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you, uh, 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 Dr. Hafez, for this very detailed expose. We just had a question from um, Jack Schauke on why your proposal for the tunnel uh, from uh, uh, the uh, Congo to the Chad Lake hasn't been um, put in place? Uh, actually, uh, I have proposed this tunnel almost seven or eight years ago to Egyptian government. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm not the man of Egyptian government. So no one listened to me. They listened to their guys. Uh, that's why they have their own expert. And they have another proposal to link the Congo through the White Nile through a surface connection by using pipe and uh, pump station and all these things, which cost them trillions of dollars. While my proposal is to run through uh, underground tunnels using uh, under gravity, no need to have a pump station and all these things. But unfortunately, as I said, I'm not their guys. So I always uh, live in a shadow. So they don't they don't allow my proposal to come to the people. But through your platform, I wish the United Nations and the World Bank uh, to 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 study the feasibility of this project because it's really will I wish can change the the the, the, the economy in the North African countries. Thank you. So. I have, Jack, if you can mute yourself, please. I have a question for you um, related to uh, the political uh, climate. Uh, because the political climate is what it is between uh, Egypt and its neighbors to the south, how likely do you think uh, is the potential uh, sort of positive outlook that you describe, integration rather than confrontation. It's a very complex web of um, relationships, let's say, between Egypt and its neighbors to the south and uh, also uh, uh, to the west. You were referencing Libya. Uh, in your analysis, how likely is the integration versus confrontation? Okay. I think one important thing we need to observe in that type of relation is most of the African country is still until now, their mentality is based on tribe thinking. And we have seen what happened between people of Ethiopia, between Tigray and the government. Okay. That's correct. It shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen. Uh, very, very frankly, uh, I think when the people of the Nile Basin country reach to uh, understand the meaning of nation, not not a tribe. So then, when when people start believe in a nation as a nation, not belong fully to the tribe, then the nation of Ethiopia will feel, will feel that they can really uh, benefit Egypt as a nation and Egypt also can benefit them. So until then, until we move from the tribe mentality to the nation mentality, I think we are not going to make much progress. So maybe in one or two generations from now, maybe the people will realize that each one of us need each one then we might get solution. But as long as we've been governed by the tribe mentality and thinking, I see for the existing time currently, maybe it's a little bit difficult to uh, cooperate fully. So in about half an hour, we're gonna hear from your colleague, uh, Professor Sam Sheldon, who is from Sudan, uh, but joining us from Auckland, New Zealand. 
and uh, he has a complimentary view to yours uh, when regarding the uh, opportunity uh, to um, dam certain rivers. Uh, his viewpoint on GERD is not necessarily the same as yours, uh, but that's okay. Um, what has been your um, um, analysis and what is the nature of your technical relationships with uh, Sudan, such an important part of the Nile Basin network? Okay, I tell you very frankly, uh, Renaissance Dam for the Sudanese is actually, see, it looks like a high Aswan Dam to the Egyptian. So Renaissance Dam is going really to benefit Sudanese. No one can deny that, all right, economically. And is going to make a very huge impact economically, socially, and in, in, in all uh, aspect of life of Sudan. But they have only one problem. The only problem is the safety factor for the dam, which until now, Egypt expert, technical expert, cannot confirm the, 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 the safety of the dam. We have three or four factors of safety for the dam. Uh, Egyptian government and Sudanese government also requested the technical calculation from the Ethiopia uh, to, 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 to look at it. Until now, according to the irrigation minister in Egypt, that Ethiopia is refusing uh, to allow the consulting firm, the French consulting firm, to study the stability and the safety of the dam. So uh, for Su Sudan and Sudanese people, the Renaissance Dam is actually a piece of gold for them. It's going to change their life for sure. But if anything happened to the dam, there is no Sudan. There is no Sudan. So it, you have to take the risk. If you if you if you if you agree on you 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 use all the uh, benefit of the dam, okay, go ahead. But you must make sure that the dam will not collapse on Sudan because if it happened, it would be a, a huge tsunami which will wash Sudanese and Sudan and no more Sudan. So it is 50-50 risk. And one element that he will mention in his talk uh, in about 30 minutes is the cost uh, to um, the local people that are being displaced because of all of this uh, uh, dam building uh, and flooding of areas. Um, so you mentioned this um, as well in um, in your talk. Uh, the Nubian people have uh, been displaced uh, and are continuing to be displaced by all this uh, uh, reworking of the ecosystems. If you take a zoom out view and you put to the side uh, um, the dam building, what is your analysis with regards to uh, man changing the ecosystems and how that's going to affect all of this very complex network, which you've explained, uh, of the Nile, basically, and people don't necessarily realize it, uh, flows from uh, the northern tip almost to the southern tip of Africa? Uh Actually, uh, I, I agree with you, man, by building dams, uh, he will change the ecosystem for the river basin countries. Uh, but now we have two options. Either we allow man to leave or we allow the ecosystem to leave, all right? So we, 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 we have to reach to compromise. Uh, and I think in, in most of the modern country like America or Canada or China, uh, they build dams, they displace people, uh, they to a certain extent impact on the ecosystem to a certain extent. So I think uh, what is happening in Egypt or Ethiopia or other African country is not an exceptional. Other great country has done that. So they are following step by step what happened in other countries like America, like uh, European countries, like Russia, like China. So if you want to solve this problem between man and ecosystem, I think we try first to solve it with a developed country before we look to the developing countries. Thank you. 
Do we have any other uh, questions, comments, people who want to share uh, um, things that uh, they've um, thought of uh, during uh, Professor Hafez's very detailed, again, uh, uh, explanation of this very intricate system? I mean, I, I was very interested to hear just how complex it is. And like you showed in the maps in the very beginning, uh, the fact that uh, the system itself, again, flows all across the continent. Uh, and I don't think any uh, everybody realizes just how interconnected the Nile uh, and basin is to all of the major river systems and the lakes. Uh, the pictures you showed of Lake Turkana being basically pumped dry is terrible. It's a yes. terrible situation, and it reminds me of what happened uh, in Russia with uh, the Aral Sea, uh, which was uh, bled dry uh, for uh, the cotton industry. Uh, is there a uh, potential of uh, the same type of terrible uh, um, man-making uh, disaster looming in your analysis in Africa? Besides Turkana? Yes, 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 yes. Actually, that 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 is my main concern for this presentation. Because uh what happened to Turkana, we have a very high possibility to happen to the Nasser Lake as one dam. We have one of the biggest man-made lake, but uh after uh, Renaissance Dam, especially during the drought time, even the Renaissance Dam might not have enough water for uh, for itself. So uh, in that in that case, uh, like the the drought time during 1978 and 1988, that, that ten years, the the Aswan Lake or High Dam re Reservoir reached only only 0 0.6 meter above dead storage. So if the drought continue one more month, then Egyptian at that time 50 years ago wouldn't have enough water to drink. So now the population compared to the population 50 years ago has increased by 250%. So if this been repeated again for 10 years drought, uh, I think the Egyptian won't last for, 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 for uh, maybe after first year of drought, then you might not find any Egyptian on the road, you know? So I'm, I'm concerned about what happened to Turkana, uh, but at the same time, I wish that not to happen to a swan dam and uh, Nasser Lake because this will be a disaster. So we have to uh, find solution now, not tomorrow. World Bank, United Nations should interfere to 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 to, to help the world, the the Nile Basin country to come to a win-win situ situation. We are not going to uh, press Ethiopia much for that. As I said, Ethiopia can produce electricity and with the electricity, the water will come, but provided to produce enough electricity to and produce enough water along that, then it shouldn't be a problem. So we have a question from uh, Mohammed Awad, who actually put us in touch uh, together. So thank you again, Mohammed, for this. Uh, he says the following in the chat, uh, the RD uh, is such a huge dam that uh, it is a problem, but it, it is real now. Uh, what is the ideal remedy? That is Mohammed. The ideal what? Remedy, the remedy. What's the solution? Uh, actually, we already passed the time for any remediation because we are reaching to the uh, fourth filling, which almost reached to 50 billion. We already passed talking about remediation. What in reality now in the site, uh, cannot be changed by 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 the discussion or negotiation. It's already done. But the only hopefully remedy is 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 kind of cooperation between Ethiopia and uh, Egypt. And uh, as I said, Ethiopia can produce more electricity, say around what I mentioned, two thousand one hundred megawatt hour for over the three hundred sixty five days. Per year, then the, with with that electricity can produce the forty eight point five billion cubic meter, which Egypt expected to have it every year from the Blue Nile. But if Ethiopia 
refuse to uh, produce that amount of electricity, then Egypt will have a very bad shortage of water. It might reach to around uh, around 25 billion cubic meter, which really will be a, a big problem, economical problem to Egypt. So we already passed the, uh, the actual remedy because they already completed the dam. Uh, and I don't think uh, Serbia are willing to reduce the height of the dam or re re willing to reduce uh, the, the, the reservoir capacity unless World Bank convince Ethiopia to just keep the uh, reservoir to something around 35 billion cubic meter. And that will be a great favorite for World Bank. Thank you. So Jack has another question. I'm going to unmute him. Uh, yeah, you didn't introduce yourself. Uh, you are working for the United Nations for uh, because you are the host, and we oh. didn't. Uh... Okay, you have a question for me then. Okay. Oh. No, no, no. It's a question for Dr. Muhammad, but I need to, to know you because you didn't introduce yourself. Oh, because I introduced myself this morning, and uh, let me mute you because there's some background. So I, I work for the Peace Innovation uh, Institute, the Hague. I need to mute you, Jack, because there's too much echo. Uh, thank you, Jack. So I work for the Peace Innovation Institute at The Hague. We're a research institute based in the Netherlands, but I work remotely from Canada. We're an NGO, and uh, we work uh, alongside what's called the Triple Helix. I'm going to share uh, my screen uh, uh, so to show you what our work entails. Our work uh, is about connecting... Uh, what uh, uh, needs to uh, happen to effect change, academia, civil society, political leadership, each at the table to learn from each other and collaborate and cooperate. Uh, we only have 82 months left until 2030. We need to uh, work alongside each other and be collaborative exactly uh, like uh, Dr. Efez has been saying between the Nile Basin countries, but this is true of the entire world. Uh, so I'm going to share uh, uh, this presentation again uh, in uh, the uh, chat. So that's a, a bit of a uh, intro on myself and I'm going to unmute you again, Jack, but there's a big echo. Uh, so please ask your question and then I'll mute you again uh, so that uh, everyone can hear. Thanks a lot, Frederick. You are doing a great job, my dear friend. Uh, the doctor, Thank Dr. you. Mohammed, uh, Dr. Mohammed, the yes. The fact that this is who it needs to be updated because I went to a study of Libyan river. You know the the, the yes, the, yes, yes, yes. I sent you. I sent you the note. The cost. The cost of one kilometer is one one hundred million or uh, one million one million dollars. Did you present? the new update of your project to the, to the United Nations, because this is very important. How come $1 trillion uh, is uh, thrown in, uh, in the sea and uh, the Congo president accepted that he, he, uh, he approved the project? He's already approved it. So forget about Egypt. I know Egypt is a bureaucratic country. The, the problem with Ethiopia Dam is that the, the old regime, Mubarak, gave them hell until Omar Suleiman. Omar Suleiman told them, if you build anything, we're going we're gonna to destroy it. So they have a vendetta with us. They will never permit us to give us. They own the, the water now. So forget Ethiopia. We need to find another solution. So you need to update the, the, your project, present it to the United Nations, find your friend there, make pressure on Egypt to accept it. Because Egypt don't care about the people. You need to know that they don't they don't care about nothing. You saw the regime what it's doing to the people now. So finish your okay. project update. All right, all right. My, my, my answer to you. Let me answer you. Okay, because this is supposed to be a question. Okay. 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 Uh, Thank you, Jack. Yeah. I muted you because of the feedback. We hear you, and I'm going to let uh, Dr. Right. Hafez answer. If Egypt and Sudan and Libya and the Shad spend 10% of their military budget uh, to, to, to construct such tunnel, 
over the coming 10 years, the tunnel will, we will have enough fund and investment to uh, build that tunnel. So instead of buying Rafale from uh, France cost you 15 billion US dollar, invest that amount of money in uh, 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 drilling that tunnel and that will, will help Egyptian people much, much more than uh, Rafale uh, uh, aircraft. So we need to uh, uh, arrange our priority. Is our priority to take all the money of Egypt or Libya or, and buy tanks and buy military and buy aeroplanes uh, or to, 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 to build such a huge tunnel? Uh, I believe I believe the Egyptian people they need water than uh, aircraft from France. I couldn't agree with you more, especially because the aircraft from France are are being paid for uh, by Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, which uh, has been acting as a sponsor of all of these military projects. Uh, and in answer to, I'm guessing. Jack, there's too much. I'm going to mute you again. I can't hear you. And uh, please uh, write down your questions, but I, I can't have you uh, um, speak all the time. I'm sorry, because we have to move on. Uh, uh, and uh, we are going to work uh, with uh, several parties. This gathering today is the start of a cycle of uh, gatherings to present these projects to the United Nations. People that have been speaking all throughout the day are working with the United Nations, the transboundary uh, uh, network uh, uh, at Bennington and University of Vermont. I'm going to share their uh, um, website in the chat. You can look them up. Uh, they're working on um, very impressive uh, <clears throat> projects with uh, the UN. Uh, so I invite everybody to look at what they do. Uh, we also have, I think, Christine uh, from the other Transboundary Network of Networks, uh, or she was here before, um, so she's not there anymore, but I'll also reference them. Uh, so be aware, uh, everyone who's who's listening in, that uh, we're not just talking to ourselves. We are talking to uh, rel uh, uh, the, the right people at the UN level. Uh, all right, so we only have a few minutes left uh, because it's very late your time, uh, 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 Dr. Hafez. I don't want to keep you too too late. Um, in in another sort of conclusion to your talk, uh, you remain hopeful. Uh, and uh, your talk is all about um, enhancing collaboration. Um, you had mentioned to me another project, maybe we want to come back to it, um, that could start maybe for a uh, demonstration of this collaboration, which was a canal that you referenced. Uh, maybe you want to come back to that uh, and speak to it because uh, it could be the start of this type of uh, uh, pan-African uh, projects. Uh, yes, yes. I think you mean uh, the canal in South Sudan. Yes, I do. Uh, which, which actually, uh, as I said, it was uh, promoted by President Anwar Sadat 50 years ago. And we have invested almost around 80 million US dollar in 1970. So it's around 50 years ago. And after we have spent all that amount of money, uh, then uh, the civil war started. And one of the reasons for civil war started that the leader of the South Sudan, they uh, convinced the people that Egypt is coming to uh, occupy South Sudan, all right? But of course it was not true, but we, we don't have access to talk and communicate with the South Sudanese people, but this is what happened. So the first things uh, when the civil war start, the, Sudan, the South Sudanese people, they went and burned all the equipment and killed some of the Egyptian and who consider us as Egyptian their enemy. So as I said early, as long as the African country is ruled by the 
tribe mentality, it would be very difficult to, 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 to co cooperate, very frankly. So unless we reach to a standard where people, they think of their nation, not of their tribe, then cooperation between nation to nation, it will be really uh, materialized and people will realize the benefit of that. But as long as we are divided uh, between this tribe thinking, I think, I'm very sorry to say, we won't move one step forward. Understood. So I answered uh, Jack's question, which was, what is the cost of the Congo project? I'm not sure. And why can't uh, the uh, UN force the situation um, to its resolution? Uh, and my answer is, it's more uh, the World Bank than the UN itself. Uh, there is going to be this uh, coming summer in uh, Vancouver GEF, which is the Global Environment Fund meeting, uh, and it's specifically going to be about these types of projects. So please be aware, Jack, that all of this is being looked at right now. And Canada is playing a role because it's happening in Canada. I will be there in Vancouver. Uh, and it'll be a, a time to promote these types of projects. So again, today's gathering is also to serve as, again, the start of a cycle of uh, uh, meetings to prepare this uh, August. It's going to be late August Vancouver uh, meeting. Uh, so don't worry, we're we're on the case, as it were. So for the, with this, I want to thank um, uh, uh, Professor Hafez, Dr. Hafez, for his presentation and his uh, uh, open dialogue that we've been able to have very late uh, his time because it's uh, in the middle of the night. So I will I will let him go, <laughs> and uh, thank you for this uh and uh we're going to take uh about 10 or so minutes uh, pause before our next speaker uh um, is joining us from uh, New Zealand and he will bring uh, the Sudanese perspective on the Nile basin. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, so let's take a bit of a pause, uh, go out and stretch your legs, grab a coffee, something to drink, uh, and uh, we'll be back. Uh, yes, thank you, Mohammed, because it's thanks to you that uh, we had uh, the pleasure of uh, uh, Dr. Hafez uh, uh, presenting. I'm going to stop the recording now.